During the season of Lent, we are looking at the last words of Jesus, words according to the four Gospels that Jesus spoke from the cross. Last week it was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And a little later, in the very same scene, come the words uh, that will be our focus today. So we look now at Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Let us listen together for God's word. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we pray that by the power of your spirit, that you would speak to us today that we might hear what you want us to hear, so we might do what you want us to do and be who you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. (coughs) Ever since Luke put pen to paper, good-hearted and faithful Christians have had a problem with this story problem with this very scene. With a man hanging on the cross next to Jesus, a common criminal who did who knows what with the days of his life and here in the 11th hour at the very literal last minute manages to eke his way into paradise. This is when our resentments start to kick in a little bit. These are the resentments of the older brother and the prodigal son story. The resentments of those who have worked hard for what we have, who have worked hard for the assurance of God's grace and salvation. Really, when it boils down to it, it's about fairness, Jesus. And in all fairness, this isn't fair. Am I right? But I want to set that problem aside for now because I have other problems with this story and I'm the preacher, so we get to focus on my problems. (laughs) Clearly, as this story is presented to us, one criminal is bad and one criminal is good. One of them mocks Jesus, derides Jesus. The other defends him claims his innocence. One criminal demands that he be saved from this painful death. The other humbly requests to be remembered. They're foils for each other. They're set in deliberate contrast against one another to drive home the point. And my problem is my sympathy for the first criminal. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. Crucifixion is is a bad day. There's no doubt about that. But then imagine you've been hung up on a cross to die in view of the public, to be exposed to the elements, and hanging on the cross next to you is the one who has made a name for himself by raising the dead and healing the sick and demonstrating divine power. What would you do? I know what I would do. I would look over at this man next to me who has all this power at his disposal, who's wasting his dying breaths, offering forgiveness. And I would say, hey, snap out of it. We're dying here. Save yourself and us while you're at it. Aren't you the one that God has chosen to save us? Aren't you the Messiah? Then this other guy pipes up, puts me in my place, 
We are getting what we deserve, he says. But this man is innocent. Jesus, remember me. Two criminals, two very different responses to their situation, two very different attitudes toward Jesus, two very different takes on salvation. And it is on this subject of salvation that my problem takes root. There is a school in the world of theology that is referred to as liberation theology. It's been around for a couple of generations. It grew largely out of the Latin American context in the 1960s, a time when dictatorships were on the rise, people were being oppressed, and the Catholic leaders, some of them in those places, began to give voice to a new way of imagining the stories of Scripture, a new way of imagining the faith that spoke directly to the needs of the oppressed. This, uh, this uh, liberation theology also allowed African Americans to give voice to their experience of racism and oppression. It gave new voice to feminists as they read Scripture. It is essentially a reading of Scripture from the margins, the margins of power, the margins of society, the margins of what somebody has some, at some point labeled as orthodoxy, the right way to think and believe. The basic assumption is that these traditional, long-standing readings at certain times and in certain places have served to oppress the powerless or at the very least have failed to address serious injustices going on in the world. And some of these stories need to be re-read. Good example of this is the Exodus story. You probably learned in school that when the pilgrims and others came from Europe to the New World, that they came with an understanding of themselves as the chosen people of God, heading toward the promised land, leaving Egypt behind them. And as God's chosen people in this new promised land, they had a divine mandate to establish themselves, which gave rise to the idea of manifest destiny and a feeling of, of uh, uh, invincibility and anything they needed to do to fulfill that destiny was okay with God. It's the story that was told. Meanwhile, African slaves in this country over time become Christians and they hear the story of the Exodus. And you won't be surprised to know they hear that story very differently. Instead of having already left Egypt behind and being the chosen people of God, they are enslaved in Egypt under the power of Pharaoh. And they are awaiting the powerful, liberating God to enter in and work on their behalf. Two stories or rather, same story, one story, one Bible, two very different readings of that story. And in the long tradition of Christian orthodoxy, salvation has tended to mean eternal life in heaven. So you can probably guess the way that this key element of the Christian faith can be used to keep slaves subservient, to prevent the oppressed from rising up, to ensure that those who are suffering don't seek redress, everything will get better in heaven. At the end of this life is a paradise. But the criminal on the cross rejects this anesthesia. He cries out against it. Aren't you the one God sent for us? He says, we're in this together now. We're both suffering, save yourself and save us. Now the text says that he was deriding Jesus, he was mocking Jesus, but you can hardly fault the dying man. And from what we know of Rome, and the nature of Roman oppression in Palestine played out so painfully in the story of Jesus, we can trust that this man was probably more guilty than Jesus was but probably also not deserving of such a gruesome and painful punishment for whatever it was that he had done. So here's why this story is problematic for me as a preacher. 
I can't ignore the cry of this first criminal. I can't just paint him as the bad guy. Because wouldn't I want the same thing in his position? Wouldn't I expect the same thing of Jesus in that position? To just ignore him and paint him as the bad guy is to ignore the cry of those who are demanding God's action now, today. Those who need liberation from suffering, from oppression. Those who find themselves on the crosses of injustice and are asking God to save them now. Now at the same time, we can't deny that the text is pointing us toward the conclusion that the second criminal on the cross has a better response than the first. Jesus, remember me. This leads to Jesus responding with those words, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This conversation is uh, remarkable. These words of this second criminal are truly remarkable. For one thing, this is the only place in all four Gospels where anyone addresses Jesus simply by name without any kind of veneration or title. He's talking directly to Jesus as if he has a right to do so. But more significantly, when everyone else seems to think that Jesus dying on the cross is undoing all of this hard work that Jesus has been doing. The man next to him on the cross is the only one, it seems, who doesn't think that the work of God has been nullified because Jesus is dying on the cross. He's the only one who sees that the crucified Messiah still has a kingdom. A couple days later, in Luke's Gospel, Two disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus and Jesus comes and walks along next to them, but they don't know that it's Jesus. And they say to Jesus, they say, we had hoped that he would be the one to renew Israel. We had hoped, but we've given up that hope now. because He's not supposed to die on a cross. And Jesus says, was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? The second criminal sees what the first can't see. The first is looking for salvation from death. That's what the first criminal is after. And this is a good thing to want. It's a good thing to receive, but it's not a permanent good. I'm thinking of Lazarus. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and he comes out of the grave and he smells a little right. And his sister who's now glad to see her brother alive, also knows that he will die again someday. But the cry of this first criminal should remind all Christians to work for the liberation of those who suffer, to preserve the lives of the sick and the malnourished, to provide for the welfare of the poor and the downtrodden, to fight systems of injustice that put people on crosses every day. This sort of salvation, however, can easily lead us to think too much of our own power, to trust too much in the power that this world grants to us, military power, political power, or even our own skewed ideas of what divine power looks like. Our pleading for salvation then sours when we don't get what we want and it turns to derision and we mock the God that we think should be acting on our behalf. We demand that God should do what we want and when we want it. The second criminal sees something that the first criminal cannot see. The second criminal is not seeking salvation from death, instead seeking salvation through death. In the eyes of this second criminal, the cross is not a mistake or an accident, as devastating as it is. It's not an impediment to the otherwise successful work of God. It's not the end of an otherwise bright hope for Israel's future. The cross is emblematic of how God works. It's through self-giving 
that looks like giving in. It's through humility that looks like weakness. It's through grace that looks like foolishness. It's through a cross that looks like defeat. It's through death that looks like the end. But it is just the beginning. It's the beginning of our liberation from death itself. It's the beginning of our liberation from feeling so constrained by death's power that we have to take into our arsenal whatever power we can muster, whatever power we find at our disposal. It's the beginning of a people who see suffering and injustice in the world and work to alleviate it. It's the beginning of a people who not only work for the liberation of all who suffer, but also in their life together embody a kingdom in which suffering will end. It's the beginning of a people who have given up competing with each other for a heavenly reward and instead are committed to the earthly good of their neighbor. So we shouldn't be scandalized by this man who, let's just assume, lived a terrible life full of sin and all kinds of awful deeds there hanging on the cross and invited at the last minute into paradise. We shouldn't be scandalized by this because that's just us wanting to exercise our own power over our own eternal well-being. We do not have such power. Instead of looking at this man and being scandalized, we should learn an honest prayer. Jesus, remember me. This prayer does not seek to evade death. But at the same time, it doesn't believe that death has power over life. Jesus, remember me. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. God, we at times cry out, like the first man in search of salvation from what troubles us, salvation from death. And surely there are so many around the world who are making that very cry at this very moment. We pray for their liberation from suffering. But we pray also to follow the example of the second man the humble prayer, the eyes that see clearly that you do indeed work through weakness and death for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray.